Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRTLP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm Bill Buchanan, I'm the host. Thank you for tuning in. Each year, UC Davis chooses one graduating senior to receive its university medal. The prize recognizes excellence in undergraduate studies, outstanding community service, and the promise of future scholarship and contributions to society. This year's medalist, effectively the top student from a graduating class that includes many thousands of accomplished students, is Jumana Iso. She is an English major who grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and the country of Jordan. And among other things, she wants to study fiction involving climate change. Like all of our recent shows, we're doing this by Zoom. So the sound quality isn't what you get in the studio, but the gist of the show should be intact. Jamana, thank you for appearing on Davisville today. Thank you for having me. First, congratulations. Uh, you know, tell us about the moment when you learned you had received really this extraordinary prize. Uh, what did you do when you heard the news? Thank you. I um, was interviewed pretty late on in the quarter to the point where I didn't really know if I was still up for the university medal because I didn't know in normal quarters if you figure out this later on that you are the recipient of it. So after interviewing, I thought that it went really well. And two days later, I received a call from the university that said, do you know the news yet? And I was like, no, but if it was bad news, it would be really sad that I'd received the call first. But then I got an email that said, you're the university medalist effectively. And so I called my parents and they're in Jordan. So the time zone was a bit off, but um, they were really excited for me. Did you end up waking him up in the middle of the night? Um, I think, yeah, it was, it was nighttime for them. I don't think I woke them up, but receiving a call from me that late, they knew that it must be like news of some sort, but they were really excited for me. Yeah, I, I can know. imagine. That's quite a phone call to get uh, from uh, the campus. You know, have you heard the news yet? Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, um, maybe? <laughs> they were like, did you receive any emails today? And I was like, no. And they're like, so you don't know the news yet. I was like, this would be really depressing if I didn't get it. <laughs> you know, I guess we should explain a little bit the, the process for winning the medal. It isn't uh, simply that you had the highest grade point average or anything like that, right? I mean, you have to be nominated and you get evaluated. I mean, the Academic Senate gets involved, as I understand. It's yes. not just an automatic thing like you got more A pluses than anyone else. No, uh, no. We had, um, I think... Each college has its own set of awards and you can win the award, but still have to be nominated by the college. So I'm not sure who else was being interviewed for the university medal, but I'm assuming that it would be the top student in engineering, ag science, bioscience, et cetera. Yeah, all of whom I'm sure are very accomplished students to, to get to that level. So your parents were in Jordan, were they able, uh, and you just graduated from UC Davis. You know, there wasn't a physical ceremony this year because of the, the pandemic. I know, were your, your parents able to participate in your online graduation? So I was a bit confused by the format of our online graduation and I sent links, but the way that it worked was we had kind of short clips by the chancellor and the deans of the colleges and you can just click on the slide. So it wasn't so much as they participated, but I mean, I, I sent links <laughs> to people that, that wanted to be involved in it. Yeah. But yeah, it was, a, it was a bit different this year, obviously. And I'm glad that they didn't buy tickets to come to the U.S. way early on. <laughs> so how, how did you, you, you grew up in California and in Jordan. So how did you come to grow up in both countries? So. Yeah, uh, my dad went to college in the U.S. He went to Chico State. And so I was born in the U.S. And they had kind of work and connections in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then when we were, when I was six, we moved back to Jordan for work and then spent five years there, moved back here, <laughs> spent like three years here, moved back there again, moved back here. I spent part of high school here, hence why I went to a UC and kind of was able to stay in California. But it was, I grew up in both places because it was a lot of back and forth. You know, I would think that would be interesting two different countries and back and forth so that you can almost compare, you know, high school in Jordan, high school in California. Yeah, yeah um, very different, wildly different countries and education systems. It's, it was a bit weird to jump back and forth between them because I spent ninth grade in Jordan and 
I was taking like biology, physics, and chemistry all at the same time. And then I would come back to the US and each science was like a year of your high school experience. Like you took biology as a freshman and then you ended your high school experience with physics. And so I was like, why isn't everyone just taking all of them at once? Like this is the IB kind of the protocol for foreign countries. So you majored in, in English at UC Davis. Why did you choose English? I've always loved reading and literature. And especially in high school, I started to realize that this was the subject that I was drawn to the most. But when I was applying to college, a lot of people were kind of scaring me out of choosing my passion as a major. Because they're like, what about financial security? Or how are you going to get a job? Or what do you plan on being? Like, you need to look into what an English major can lead you to. And so I applied to all the UCs and CSUs as an undeclared major. And then once I got to Davis and I took my first English class, I declared English because I realized that I, yeah, I do love it. And I'm not going to be scared away by what people say about it. That's a very common debate discussion. I say this, uh, I have two daughters. They're, they're out of college now but certainly among their friends, that very question, you know, do you study something that draws you or do you have strictly a financial consideration? And, you know, these days, a lot of the, the, the language, or a lot of the discussion seems to favor things like the STEM, you know, being very practical, but you chose English and you did very well at it. What do you want to do with it? What do you want to do, not with your degree necessarily, but I mean, where do you want to go with your life? Uh, that is the question that I've been dreading answering. And only yeah. because kind of with everything happening in the world right now, I know that even having set plans doesn't necessarily mean that your life is going to go on a specific course. Like I know a lot of friends who are in the business realm who've had internships since their junior year, which guaranteed them jobs after graduation. And now they're in the position where they don't know if they have their job because of everything happening in the world and because of, you know, the kind of crisis that we're going into after graduation. And so I've been wary about designating a career for myself post-grad school, but also because I don't really know. I think that choosing to apply to Cambridge was when I talked to Francis Dolan about it, I was saying, and if I don't get financial aid, I won't go and then I'll figure out something else. And then I got the scholarship and now I had financial aid and I was choosing to go there and it became that while I'm there, I will decide what I'll do after. Or if I really enjoy my master's program, maybe it'll turn into a PhD, et cetera. And so, yeah, we, we should, we should explain there that uh, you, among other things, you've earned a full ride scholarship at the University of Cambridge, which is where you're going this fall in England, you know, assuming, assuming things go as, as uh, intended. Yes. Uh, yeah. The Gates Cambridge scholarship. We should mention Frances Dolan, too, who also appeared on the show several years ago. She is a professor at UC Davis, uh, English professor. So she was someone you took several classes from, I believe, right? She was a real sort of a mentor to you. Yes. Yeah. She is, has been a great support system and mentor for me. And I just kept wanting to take classes with her whenever I saw her name pop up on a syllabus for a specific quarter. Kind of turned to her for advice, even for applying for the university medal or for the Letters and Sciences nomination that Len led to the University Medal and for grad school and what I could do after and what I could use the English major for. So she's been very helpful with that. So you've got a, a, a couple of interests that um, have, uh, I'm sure there's more than two, but a couple that have surfaced in the initial campus articles about uh, your awards. Uh, that's uh, refugees and also uh, climate fiction, meaning fiction where climate change is part of the story, not that climate change is fiction. Tell us about those. So why, why do those draw you as subjects? I think that with issues of refugees and displacement, uh, I'm Palestinian, even though I grew up in Jordan, and that's because of displacement. So my family both my mom and my dad's side had to go to Jordan because of the war. And so issues um, regarding refugees have always kind of interested me because it's very close to home. And so when I took my first human rights class through the university honors program, I started to volunteer with Article 26 Backpack, which focuses on kind of guaranteeing that refugees can still 
document their past um, careers and education through a cloud-based app. And so when I focused on that throughout college, even in English classes, there's always still issues of human rights violations that appear in our literature, whether it be about like World War II or the Vietnam War, anything that you read will have social issues embedded in it. And so when I looked at human rights violations and issues of refugees, I realized that in the next 50 years, ecological refugees are going to be increasing wildly because of floods or islands disappearing or people being displaced from their homes along the coast. And that's not really an issue that people see as climate change as a human rights issue. They kind of see it as disparate things like climate change is a storm or a fire and human rights violations are wars and genocides. But, you know, storms and fires could lead to those two things or displacing people is just as big a human rights violation as leaving because of needing asylum. And so when tackling my thesis and turning to climate fiction, I wanted to knit those two issues together. But I also didn't really know what climate fiction was until last year when I took a climate fiction course with Professor Tobias Manili. I I obviously love literature being an English major, but I wasn't aware that there was a genre dedicated to climate change and representing it through these non-realist modes. Yeah, in fact, I, one of the articles I read on UC Davis uh, talking about your interest referred to it as cli-fi. Yes. And I'll, I'll be honest, <laughs> I wasn't familiar with that term uh, either. Climate fiction, I understand, but it, it, I wasn't aware that it had become so defined as to already have acquired that nickname. Oh yeah, sci-fi and cli-fi. <laughs> yeah. Your honors thesis, he wrote, was about African futuristic works in climate fiction. Yes. Right? So tell us about those. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a specificity there that I find interesting. Yes. So I kind of discussed how the climate crisis is this crisis of culture and imagination in terms of you have to transform your literary approach to adapt to these changed circumstances in our world, in the Anthropocene, because we are trying to translate climate change into this lasting story, but we can't really represent climate change through realism. You can't put yourself in the eye of the hurricane or discuss nature as its own kind of agency of matter without turning to non-realist modes. And the authors that I examined do turn to non-realist modes and they specifically use the structure of myth in their works. And all of them are linked by the fact that they are black women. And when I started looking into their works, a lot of people labeled them as Afrofuturist because they turn to this future world where they're reimagining a land changed by climate change or the climate crisis, as well as still discussing the social issues that Black women and Black people face in the world, because they don't just go away when you're imagining climate change. And that's what interested me about um, Octavia Butler. She has a lot of interviews in the science fiction world where people tell her to put away the quote unquote race issues because she's talking about sci-fi and how can you have that alongside the technological changes. But I think what's great about the works that I've kind of tackled is that they show the changed circumstances due to this extreme weather events and apocalypse essentially, but still focus on how, you know, racial othering is still an issue, genocides and wars based on race, as well as climate change are an issue. They bring the two concepts together to show that climate change and human rights violations are one and the same. So what interested me about them, I didn't necessarily choose them going into it knowing like these are all black women, but when I finally decided on the books that I would be writing about for my thesis, it kind of came to me when I was discussing it with my thesis advisor, Professor Manili, that all of them are black women, all of them use myth. Why is it that these African-American authors are using myth. And, and are these primarily U.S. writers that you're talking about here? Or are these writers uh, actually in Africa? Yes, Nadi, Nadia Korfor is Nigerian-American, I believe. And she has spent summers in Nigeria and lived in the U.S. And so she's kind of like me in that way. But Octavia Butler, African-American. Are you interested in writing fiction yourself, climate fiction? 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't really tried to write climate fiction or any kind of fiction throughout college. It's mostly been kind of literary criticism. But I mean, it's an interesting path. And obviously researching the narratological methods and talking about all these authors would allow me to see what works and what doesn't and kind of approach it from a new angle, possibly discussing the Middle East and climate change. But I haven't, I hadn't, as I said, I hadn't given much thought to post-grad school quite yet. Yeah, well, you've got plenty of time, obviously, if that's something you, you, you want to pursue. We are talking with Jumana Iso. Uh, she is this year's university medalist at UC Davis, which means she is considered the top under top graduating senior this year. The program is uh, Davisville on Bill Buchanan, and this is on KDRT. Um, refugees, a big subject with you as well. And Jordan is a country of 10 million with about 745,000 refugees, uh, I was reading. This is according to the United Nations. And I'm thinking that's a big number in a country of that size. And these are mostly from the, the Syrian war, but there's also um, a climate change angle here too, I believe, right? Yeah, definitely. I think that Jordan, especially without this strain on its resources, doesn't really have much resources to be spreading around because the location with drought and this kind of limited land space where refugees are ha having to huddle into tents. And now with Corona too, there's a lot of risk for refugees in all countries, but specifically in the Middle East, I think that Jordan is kind of the push for my discussion of refugees in the climate change uh, narrative, specifically because there are major barriers for refugees in new environments, but in places like Jordan where the citizens themselves don't really have that much leeway for resources, refugees kind of get placed um, into this. Um, I can't really find the words for it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's enormous. Uh, uh, obviously, it's not a problem we can solve in a, a minute or two, but what would help, do you think? With the refugee crisis? Yeah, I mean, what would help, what would help address this? I don't know if you have thoughts on that. I am not really sure what would help tackle, I mean, like in general with refugees or specifically in the Middle East, I know that there's obviously a myriad of issues that leads to people being displaced from their countries. And so I know that to stop this, con this you know, issue entirely, we'd have to tackle climate change and we'd have to find the root cause of wars and then see you know, everything happening in these countries and focus on it bit by bit. And so I'm not really sure what would, what would help in this scenario. I know that with the Syrian revolution, a lot of people have started to link it to rising temperatures, displacing millions of people into the city, which then led to conflicts in the city, hence the revolution. But it's not entirely climate change. And so I can't say once we solve climate change, there will no longer be wars and refugees, but. Yeah, and, and certainly too, I mean, uh, it's, it's a, it is a big problem. I, I'm thinking one of the purposes of literature, I suppose, is to illustrate uh, conditions, problems in such a way that, they, uh, that other people can understand them. Yes, uh, yeah, it's just a frame of reference for people. And I think the fact that I'm so drawn to fiction. It's also this, this suspended disbelief in terms of it is a real issue and you know that you can imagine something like this happening in the real world, especially with fiction that's based on climate change or wars. You know that it has happened, but the story itself is fictional. So you have this level of remove where you can not be immobilized by it. And I think that's what's interesting as well about climate change fiction because there are utopias, dystopias, apocalypses, everything in between, but you aren't necessarily in this world that's fully on fire, at least not yet. And so it either gives you a future that you can imagine that's hopeful where we adapt and where we've stopped emissions, or possibly one where 
we go on business as usual and realize now, you know, the world is underwater and what have we done to it? Because I think that this speculative futurity is, it's a part of climate fiction, but it's also just a part of the news. Like if you read an article that's like the Arctic might fully disappear and it's already melting right now, but this could happen or the probability of this occurring is this much. All of it is speculating because we don't really know what's going to happen in the future. We're just basing it on what we're doing now. But we could, in a week, completely stop emissions or we could, as soon as this pandemic is over, completely go back to how we were before. And so I think that the merits of using fiction for climate change is because we are also engaging in fiction making in our news and in everyday life when we're trying to imagine a world in the future altered by climate change. You know, listening to you right now, I think you've just made a pretty good argument for why an English degree is worth pursuing. Thank you. <laughs> because it's partly to grapple with things, uh, whatever the issue may be. It's a chance to grapple with these larger questions and is, uh, as a culture, as a world, work them out. I don't want to get too high fluting here, but I, I think that's, I think that's always been one of the purposes of the humanities, is to sure. think and figure it out. And also, um, I was discussing this with my thesis advisor recently because I was in a human rights and climate justice class, and for my uh, final project, I chose to talk to everyone about climate fiction. Although the class is kind of a poli-sci, IR-themed human rights class where we discussed law, policy, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so a lot of people were like, why fiction? And so I gave them my own response, but I turned to my thesis advisor way after and I was like, I didn't know what to say to all these poli-sci majors about why fiction? And he said, well, our world is organized around narrative. And as poli-sci majors, they should know that if a president wins an election, it's because he has the most appealing story. And we all are crafting stories for people and kind of also selling our stories to others. And so when someone turns to you and says, why fiction? Well, this is just another kind of story. And I think that that's important to articulate social issues, climate change, issues of refugees, displacement. I mean, my, some of my favorite narratives helped me figure out the scale of the issue, like Exit West by Mohsen Hamid. He talks about kind of refugees and displacement, but he uses magical realism where there are doors in a world and you open them and you can get into a different country through it, which it's very cool. And it kind of relates to my thesis in terms of using non-realist modes, but it's also a way of thinking about borders and how they're imagined and how we divide countries arbitrarily. It's, it's very interesting to think about how fiction has oriented the way I think about social issues. We have a few minutes left. I wanted to ask some questions that are, are sort of more prosaic, but, but given that you've accomplished at this level, I think people might be curious in your answers. And one of them is simply, how did you manage to achieve everything that you needed to do to achieve at this level? Several years ago, I talked to one of your predecessors as a medalist, and uh, I'd have to actually go back and listen to it, but part of it was I think she avoided social media, or at least Facebook. And I think her brother cooked meals for her from time to time. Point was, those are small details perhaps, but that they sort of gave some insight into how she organized. And you know, that's one of the questions is how, how do we all get everything done? You've just accomplished something really quite remarkable. And I'm curious if you have any advice for how, how you managed to achieve at this level. I think that it has to do with the fact that I actually love my major. And so when it came to choosing my major's classes every quarter, I would look at the description and see what most interested me. And if I saw, you know, British novel to 1900, I immediately chose it. And it was also helpful that the professors were amazing and the TAs and the resources that I had at Davis helped me achieve what I did. But also with GE classes, I did the same thing. I wasn't going on Davis websites and seeing, you know, easy A or what's the best class to take if you don't want to try. I would just see what interested me and it, the interest helped me try harder. And I also, I know it's weird to say, but I like to sit down and, and kind of read for class and, and do my writing. And a lot of people in college were like, ah, I'm just going to skim this book or Sparks Notes it and 
just try to do as well as I can on this pop quiz, but I would read to read and then it would help with the quiz when I remember the things that I do. In terms of community service and the other factors that led to the university medal, that's, it's also the same, you know, with human rights issues and refugees. I talked to professors about their programs after taking their classes and decided to volunteer for them. It wasn't necessarily like, I need this many hours of community service for the university honors program requirements or doing something as a means to an end. It was because I wanted to do the things and then it became this thread woven throughout my research and it helped me in other factors. And I really like to connect issues. Like if I'm taking an environmental science class, I would connect it to the essay that I was writing in an English class, even if it was British novels in the, in the 18th century. Somehow there is an ecological lens that you can take with this. So I'm big on connecting my classes together. So it helps that I choose things that interested me during college. So you were interested in, I believe, uh, I could summarize what you said, that you saw a real purpose to it. I mean, it, it engaged you personally, but you also saw value in it. And then that really propelled you. Exactly. Uh, you chose UC Davis because why? You could have gotten a lot of schools, I imagine. <laughs> I think as a California resident, it was really important to me to also choose pragmatically because you have in-state tuition with a lot of schools. Um, I know that's not a glamorous answer. <laughs> uh, it doesn't need to be glamorous. Just a little bit of time left. I did want to ask, besides the education, what else will you take with you from Davis? I think that the relationships that I fostered with my professors, I will continue to develop after leaving UC Davis because even during this really hectic quarter, I've had professors that aren't even teaching classes reach out and say, would you like to Zoom and just talk about life or let's, you know, meet up for a socially distanced walk and, and just talk and chat. And it doesn't have to be about school or about grad school or about the future. And I think that I was surprised choosing UC Davis that I managed to talk to my professors in this way because it's a school of over 35,000 kids and a lot of classes are big lectures, even English classes. I've taken, you know, Shakespeare where there's 90 other students in the class and you don't assume that the professor will even know your name, let alone like recognize your face. And yet here I am kind of leaving the school, emailing all these professors saying, this is when I'll be leaving Davis. I'd really love to see you or or drop this off for you. And it's been, I think this is one of the big things I'm going to take away from Davis and also one of the most surprising. All right. Well, Jumana, thank you very much for talking with us today. We've been talking with Jumana Iso, who just graduated from UC Davis with a degree in English. She's the university medalist this year. Jumana, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. This is Bill Buchanan on Davisville on KDRT. Thank you for listening.